All right, welcome back to design. Today we're going to be talking about space. When we're talking about space, we're actually talking about two different things. We're talking about the depth that is contained within an image and the positive and negative space in the image. So let's take a look at depth. We take a look at this painting by Hans Hoffmann, uh, Combinable Wall 1 and 2. We can see that the depth is pretty flat. Um, or is it really? Colors and tones uh, can create a certain sort of depth in and of themselves. And although this painting is made up of a bunch of different combinations of rectangles, um, which speaks to the overall shape of the format itself to help flatten the image, um, the colors can push and pull um, against the flatness of the picture plane. Um, Hans Hoffman talks about a, a sort of pushing and pulling tension on the, the surface um, in terms of the, the depth of the image. So that darker and cooler colors like blue uh, can recede while warmer colors and lighter colors like red and yellow might advance towards us. So even in this image, which is relatively flat across the surface uh, and actually speaks to the uh, quality of the surface itself, uh, there can be contained within that a certain sort of depth. Or if we take a look at this painting by Stanley Whitney, a uh, very similar sort of thing is going on, uh, even though this, these are much more organic shapes uh, than what Hoffman is using there. This quilt by Sue Willie Seltzer contains within it a certain amount of depth, even though it is um, overstating the, the picture plane with this emphasis on the rectilinearity and the repeated square shapes within it. Um, each individual section of, of this nine grid quilt contains um, a, a pattern that's called in quilting the log cabin pattern. And these are essentially squares within squares modulating down in size uh, to create this repeated pattern. But what this ends up doing visually is it creates a certain sort of depth within the image. It looks as if we're maybe looking down in a well, um, perhaps, or, or, um, or into a room. These repeated shapes stepping down uh, creates a sort of depth that goes back in space, while at the same time emphasizing the flatness and the tactility of the quilt itself. This is the real key to design and to, to image making um, is that your image should can't contain a tension between the depth that, is, that it is building into itself, uh, depth from the viewer away from the picture plane, um, but also at the same time to counteract that depth and to keep it flat at the same time. So there's a tension between flatness and depth uh, happening on the picture plane determined by the way that you're arranging uh, your elements on the surface. You might have the sort of depth that Pablo Picasso here is creating in his painting, uh, The Three Musicians from 1921. Um, this sort of depth, which actually shows you the floor plane, uh, the, the walls, as well as a ceiling plane, uh, you might think of um, shadow boxes that you perhaps made in elementary school. I remember creating um, shadow boxes to illustrate books that we had just read um, or different sort of uh, scenes within a, within a shoe box. Um, this sort of space that is, is actually delimiting um, and showing you the, the floor plane, the walls and the ceiling and the back plane of the picture. Um, he's telling you what the space is in the painting but at the same time he's doing things like in the bottom left you can see i'm sorry in the bottom right you can see where the floor plane ends and the back wall begins um, and if you carry that line across horizontally 
you'll find that it doesn't coincide with where the floor plane ends on the bottom left side, uh, where you have the, the dog underneath the, the chair of this um, leftmost musician. Um, so he's showing you where these planes are, but at the same time, he's, he's shifting the planes around, um, which creates a tension in, in terms of the depth. It's, it's not a, it seems to be a stated, stable space within this painting, um, but he's showing you that actually it's not, and he's having a bit of fun with, with the tension therein. Um, he's also employing the idea that uh, lighter colors advance and darker colors recede. Um, cooler colors recede while warmer colors advance. And so, for instance, in this musician on the left, I was playing what seems to be like a clarinet there, uh, he has uh, white clothes on, but the black of his arm is placed on top of the white. So while the white might advance towards us in space, the black recedes against it. Um, so he's He's allowing the white to advance, but the black is creating a sort of barrier so that it doesn't advance too far towards us. This kind of space, this shallow space, this shallow depth uh, created within the picture is something that's um, very old. We can take a look at this painting by Duccio from 1308. This is the Annunciation of the Death of the Virgin. Um, and you can see that he is doing a very similar thing to Picasso um, from 600 years prior, uh, where he's showing you the back wall, the side walls, um, and the floor and ceiling planes as well. So he's delimiting the depth of the image. It's a very shallow space close to the surface of the picture plane. Um, he's also having a bit of fun with this depth. Uh, the angel on the left-hand side um, seems to be coming in through that doorway while at the same time reaching its hand around the column uh, to present this um, bouquet of flowers to uh, the Virgin Mary on the right. Um, so it's the, the angel exists at once deeper within the picture plane, but then its arm is coming forward to us. So it's, it's existing in multiple depths at once. And again, this is, um, this is all intentional. It is a, it is a tension that the artist is seeking to create on the, the surface of the picture plane. Um, you don't want really too much far illusionistic depth in your picture. Um, this creates a hole in, in the picture when there's, when there's too much depth in it. Uh, we'll see an example of that coming up. But when there's too much depth, on the, the picture plane and pushes back too far in space, um, you can't see everything at once. The, the ideal for your image, um, whether it be in advertising or painting or whatever you're, you're creating, is that the image should be immediate, like a, like a shotgun blast. All of it happens at once. And when you create too much depth in the picture plane, then you can't see everything at once because you're looking at something closer to you and then you have to focus on something further behind. And you can't see those two things simultaneously. So here where the artist is creating depth and canceling depth at the same time, that tension occurs, um, we're able to see everything all at once, which is your, your ideal. You want, you want your image to be an immediate, impactful thing. Here is a painting, uh, again, very similar to, to what we we're just looking at um, by Carrie James Marshall called De Style from 1993. Um, and you can see that he is again giving us a floor plane and at least one wall and uh, the back wall as well. He's not showing us the um, ceiling or the right wall, but we're still getting enough information about the depth of the, um, of the image being uh, shown here to, to tell us where things are placed. And again, this is a very shallow um, sort of space. He has lifted the floor plane up. He's tilted it up towards us um, rather than letting it recede too far back. Um, in addition to that, the mirrors on the back wall help to show us or help to flatten that space again by repeating imagery. Um, you get the reflection of the barber there and the gentleman standing on the right. 
as well. Um, and you have flat um, shapes um, on the back, these starburst shapes um, and the, the emphasis of other flat shapes like um, posters or uh, the clock on the wall or the, the, um, the cabinets as well on the back wall. These flat um, geometric shapes help to pull um, the back wall back towards us. So he's uh, again at once creating depth and canceling depth at the same time. Now the title of this painting, this is a sort of side note, but the title of this painting, De Style, is actually a play on the name of the art movement um, made popular by Piet Mondrian and others. It is a Dutch word called de style, which means the style. This is an art movement that emphasized flat planes, um, the use of primary colors, um, and they even went so far as to denounce any sort of use of um, diagonals at all or round shapes in their work. Everything was square, rectilinear, flat, primary, on the surface. Uh, and you can see, if you take a look at this composition with red, blue, and yellow, that Carrie James Marshall is actually using the same color palette here. Um, so he's got a visual pun, as well as a, um, the, the title being a pun on this art movement as well going on. Uh, here's a painting by Edward Manet, the old musician. Now this is a different sort of depth, but it's not too different from the, the paintings, the images that we were just looking at, um, where the, the floor plane here, or the ground plane, you should say, because they're outside, is actually being lifted up towards us. It's almost um, similar to the way that um, photographers use a sheet of paper um, that that curves from the floor plane to the back wall uh, when they, they want to photograph an item um, in isolation. Um, Manet is using a similar sort of um, depth here where we have definitely the, um, the figures here are, are standing out and the, the floor plane that they're standing on seems to curve up behind them. There's there seems to be no real difference, um, at least in terms of depth, between uh, the sky behind them and the, the ground that they're standing on. So again, creating a very um, shallow sense of depth here. Or you might have something like this um, by Caravaggio. This is the Madonna of the Rosary. Um, this is a much more theatrical kind of space. It is a, there is a deeper recession in space um, created by uh, light figures advancing and shadows receding. Um, the use of the big uh, red curtain sash uh, across the, the top there helps to create a marker in space and you see that the, the background recedes much further than that as well. So Caravaggio can get away with this much deeper recession into space um, because of where he's placing things, the, the location of um, the figures on the, the picture plane are all determined by the underlying geometry of the picture plane, uh, the, the placement of things on proportion breaks, um, that all of these figures align with with the geometry of the picture plane itself helps to keep it at once on the surface while still giving us depth. There is a book um, by the painter um, Frank Stella. It's called Working Space. Um, and it's something that I suggest you pick up um, if, if, you're, if you want to pursue this seriously, uh, especially in painting and drawing. Um, where he talks about the, the depth, uh, in particular, of, of this painting, um, that there's this theatricality uh, to the, the depth in the painting, but also that, that Caravaggio, what he's really creating is a sort of bubble, uh, that, there is a, that there is a spherical, a half-spherical shape to the space that recedes into this painting, but at the same time, there's another half-spherical set of space that protrudes out from the painting. 
uh, and actually enters into our space, um, which is composed of the figures on in the bottom in the foreground here, um, who are on their, their hands and knees, that these figures actually come out towards us um, so that there's this sort of bubble shape to the space that's happening um, in a painting like this. Um, so Caravaggio can have, again, all of this, this really beautiful depth in the image because he's using the geometry of the picture plane so carefully at the same time. Art historians who have been able to study Caravaggio's paintings up close have noticed marks on the surface of the, the painting where he was actually pressing into the, the canvas with his palette knife to create little de denotations of where figures will go in the painting. Um, so you can rest assured that all of this, this attention to the um, underlying pic, uh, geometry of the picture plane is, is really intentional on uh, the part of Caravaggio. So here we have this more theatrical, um, spherical sort of space in an image. Or you might have something like this um, by Leonardo da Vinci, The Last Supper. I'm sure that you've seen this image before. And there is, without a doubt, uh, a lot of depth in this painting. And it's created by the, um, the geometric recession of the room, the um, panels on the right and left wall, as well as the ceiling being so geometric, and the use of perspective, which we'll look at, I think the next lecture is on perspective. Um, the use of perspective pushes the image back into space, but I wanna show you actually where all of these perspective lines land. All of the perspective lines in the image point to the right temple of Christ. So all of the directional lines in the, in the image, while creating depth, also point to the figure who is closest to the viewer. Um, so again, this is that tension. It's creating depth, but it's also pushing your eye towards the thing which is closest to you. So he's canceling depth at the same time. Furthermore, when we take that apart, we can see that the darkest area of the painting uh, is the back wall. And that darkness is placed against the, a stark contrast of light from the doorway and the windows in the back. So this crisp uh, contrast between light and dark in the, in the back of the painting and the, the area furthest, furthest from us, the viewer, actually pops that image back to the surface. So high contrast can can cancel out space as well. You'll also notice um, in the top left um, area of the painting that Leonardo is employing what's called sfumato, which means smoky. Um, this smoky area of tone in the top left so that he's actually hiding some of those perspective lines uh, through the use of darker tones um, and and really low contrast between the, the uh, tones there that hides some of those perspective lines. So if Leonardo really wanted to create deep recessionary space in this image, he could have done so, but he's choosing very intentionally to use that depth to actually create a shallow image. Again, this tension between um, the surface of the picture plane and the depth that can be created in the picture plane because he wants this image to be an immediate experience, not something that you have to look at and see the things that are close up and then look at the things that are farther away. He wants all of this to happen at once. And here's another painting by Manet, one that we've looked at. Um, I guess this is the third time that we've looked at it now, but again, where he is creating a depth, um, it's an understandable sort of depth, um, but then that, that bather in the back is actually larger than she should be. So that compresses the space back towards us, the viewer. So again, that tension between depth in the picture plane and the flatness of the surface at the same time. Uh, here's a painting by Joseph Mellord William Turner, Rain, Steam and Speed, The Great Western Railway. Um, and Turner is using what's called atmospheric perspective uh, to create depth, where um, 
that which is closer to us, this bridge that the uh, train is on, um, is has much higher contrast, so it comes towards us. And as we move further back in space, um, areas become um, lighter and cooler so that they recede into the distance. Uh, but at the same time, Turner has created so much recession in space um, and has blurred these this image so much that it kind of, instead of really receding into deep recessionary space, it kind of dissipates into, into nothingness uh, in a way. So Turner was most interested in his paintings and painting light and how light moves across surfaces. Um, so here, it, it pushes back into space, but at a certain point, it just sort of becomes a surface, the, the, the surface of the painting again. Um, so that the tactile texture of the, the surface itself is actually flattening that space back out. Again, this tension between depth and flatness is, is occurring here. And that brings us to the idea of positive and negative space. Um, if we look at this image on the right, this is called a Rubin vase. If we concentrate on the black area, we might see a vase or a chalice. But if we concentrate on the white areas, we might see two faces, uh, the faces of two people talking to each other. So if we look at this and see a chalice or a vase, then the black area is the positive form and the white area is the negative form. Uh, the positive is the figurative shape in a work of art and the negative is the empty space which surrounds um, that positive form. On the other hand, if we look at the faces, uh, the white faces in this image, then the white area becomes the positive space and the black area becomes the negative space. This is an example where um, positive and negative is, is being flipped. This is also called figure ground um, relationship here where the relationship um, between what is figurative and what is ground or background is being constantly flipped back and forth. So there is a positive and negative space to things. Uh, here is an image by Carol Walker. Um, and Carol Walker employs the language of the silhouette <clears throat> in a very um, particular and pointed way. Uh, silhouettes were created, uh, believe it or not, by a man called Silhouette. He's a French guy, that was his last name. I don't remember his first name. Um, but Silhouette would go around to, um, to different families and um, obviously wealthy families, and he would create these um, cut drawings, cut out of paper, of uh, usually children. And that was something, again, that was uh, exclusive to um, the higher class. And having your silhouette made was a, um, a signifier of your, of your class and your social status. Kara's Walk, Kara Walker's work um, deals largely with um, slavery and the violence of slavery. Um, her, she has painting, or she has drawings, these installations of silhouettes uh, on walls in which there's the positive form, like here, of the silhouette of the figure and the negative form of the wall, or in this case, the negative form being the image behind this silhouette, <clears throat> um, push and pull against one another. Um, and she's dealing with uh, really violent imagery, um, images of uh, rape um, and killings um, that explore the, the violence of, of the American slave trade. Uh, and here is an image uh, in which she's using a silhouette within a silhouette. Um, and this looks to be um, the image that is behind these silhouettes. Um, looks to be a slave trade or slave auction going on. Um, but I'm using this as an example because the negative space 
and an image should be just as active as the positive space. When we're looking at the, the Rubin vase, that's very obvious. Um, but as we continue to look at images, it, I need to, to emphasize how important the negative shape is. The negative shape pushes and pulls against the positive form. Um, so that if I take my pen out here, you can see particularly here, the way that the negative shape pushes against the, the positive form here, and then the positive form pushes against the negative shape like that. Uh, here is a particularly effective uh, instance. Inside the silhouette, here we have another silhouette that is made of negative space. Again, um, this push and pull between these different spaces is equally as important as that push and pull in depth that we were talking about between illusionistic depth and the flatness of the picture plane. Here is a drawing by Bill Trailer. Bill Trailer was an uneducated um, artist. Uh, art historians might, might call him a naive artist, um, but he, he made uh, just hundreds and hundreds of these drawings um, of just everyday life, of what he saw around him. And although he didn't have any formal training in it, um, he created these really gorgeous drawings um, that emphasized this push and pull between positive and negative form. So here, uh, in this cat drawing that we have right here, you can see the negative space, um, especially below the cat there, pushing against the positive form. You should think of the negative space as something, as an active thing. Um, it, it holds and shapes the positive form just as much as, as the positive shapes the negative space around it. And why that's so important is one, you don't want any space in your, your image to be neglected or left behind. Uh, when the negative space isn't considered, um, it's, it's very apparent um, and it is a wasted opportunity um, to engage with, with the power of the picture plane. You should think of the negative space as equally or even maybe more so important than the positive space, in fact. Um, and the other thing about the focus on, on negative space and why it's so important is that this actually gets to um, a, a psychological factor. If we look at this other drawing by Bill Trailer here. Here, the negative space is actually entering into the shape of the of the bull here. You can see the area where um, where the the white of the paper crosses over into the body of the bull. This speaks to us on a deeply psychological level. Um, this is the universe pushing against us. It is our struggle to shape and mold the universe while at the same time cha the chaotic nature of reality pushes actually back against us and the things that we are trying to achieve. Um, no one expected the coronavirus to be hitting this year. This is a total, you know, um, unprecedented sort of thing that we're dealing with. It is the chaotic nature of the universe pushing against us and we we seem to think so often in terms of um of ourselves in this um sort of heroic um ideation where we are the mover right we are what's pushing our narrative forward um and it's important to realize the effect that the universe has pushing against you uh, in fact you're not so separate from the universe as you might think. I mean, every time you breathe in, right, you're breathing in 
the air that is around you and surrounds you. So you're actually becoming one with the negative space surrounding you. Um, furthermore, there's this idea of um, superposition in physics, uh, which says that um, that electrons are shared amongst molecules. Um, so that you're sharing electrons with with everything that's surrounding you all at once and that actually electrons can exist in multiple locations at once so you might be sharing something right for all we know with um, saturn for instance with a with a molecule on saturn um, the the physics of this is actually a little bit more complicated than the way that i'm uh breaking it down in, into these sort of simple terms but that's essentially the the gist of this idea um you are not separate from the universe and the universe flows through you constantly these drawings by bill trailer um, in which the negative space plays such an important role in the shaping of the positive form speaks to this on a psychological level, whether or not you realize it when you look at these things, your mind is 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 thinking of these things on its own. These images by Bill Trailer are not so different than something like this. Um, this is a drawing from ancient Egypt, uh, from 3000 BCE here. And the Egyptians were very good at the use of negative space as a way to shape the positive form here. The negative spaces here are just as active as the positive form of the humans and the hieroglyphs here. Or this um, drawing by Aubrey Beardsley. Um, this is an illustration of the play uh, Salome by Oscar Wilde, um, where there is this huge expanse in the um, top left quadrant of all of this empty negative space. There's this idea uh, when talking about art called horror vacui. It is the, the fear of empty space. You should know that you don't have to fill up your design. It can have meaningfully negative, empty space in it um, and be very powerful for it. Um, I'm not sure really what, what, what happens in this play by Oscar Wilde um, called Salome, but um, I can assume that it's about death. We've talked about the location of figures in the bottom uh, being... Uh, a way to talk about death in visual arts. Um, this person laying down looks very dead or at least asleep. Um, so all of this negative space, this pressure in the top is pushing on and shaping the positive forms in the bottom. Um, Aubrey Beardsley was an incredibly prolific uh, artist, uh, died when he was 25. I'm going to give you a fair warning. You can shut your eyes if you don't want to see the next slide. Uh, made, he made some pretty erotic images. This is one coming up in three, two, one. Here we go, like this, which is um, from, this is an illustration from another play, um, Aristophanes' Lysistrata here. But again, you can see the use of the negative space pushing and pulling on the positive forms in this image. Okay, we're done with the uh, erotic image there. Uh, this is a painting by Robert Motherwell called La Dance, um, a bit more organic than what we were just looking at in terms of the Egyptian and the Aubrey Beardsley uh, images. Um, but again, just as much emphasis being placed on the push and pull of the positive and negative forms here. Uh, this image, Again, by Motherwell, uh, even more organic, uh, even more gestural than the last. Uh, again, there's a lot of emphasis on the way that the negative space, especially this sort of um, negative triangular shape um, that exists within this, this drawing uh, here, pushes into uh, the positive form itself. Um, and this, sort of image is not so different than one that we've looked at previously, this drawing by Endo Hiroshige. This landscape 
um, from his sketchbook here, where there's all this negative space in the center and the, the drawing surrounds that negative space and the negative space shapes then the positive forms that are being drawn here. Uh, here's a drawing by a sculptor, and uh, drawings by sculptors are usually very interesting in the way that they play with positive and negative space. These concave and convex forms um, where the, the positive figure you might traditionally think of as being mainly convex, it's pushing out into space, actually now has a lot of concave shapes on it where the, ne where the negative space pushes in on it. And you can see that the, um, the positive forms are made up of broken lines. He doesn't outline the shape all the way around. Um, there's space in between um, the lines in some of this drawing that again allows the negative space to move into and out of the positive form. Now this is a drawing for a sculpture and sculpture is obviously going to play a lot with this idea of positive and negative relationships and here is the sculpture that he made um, of Prometheus strangling the, the vulture here. And again, you can see that real emphasis on the way that the negative space moves into and out of the, the positive forms here. Here is another sculpture by Barbara Hepworth called Two Figures. Um, and again, this these shapes, these um, vertical shapes, we read as being um, humanoid. Uh, something that we can relate to, even though um, we might not, they might not have a lot of other characteristics in common with human, we read these shapes as, as human-like shapes. Um, this is intentional. It's, um, it's actually calling back to uh, ancient history quite a bit. Uh, we can see the relationship between these two figures, one slightly in front of the other, and then look at this sculpture from ancient Egypt and see a very real similarity there. This is Minkari with his queen there, um, where the shapes, uh, these human forms, are actually in very similar relationship to one another as the, um, as the Hepworth sculpture. And again, the beautiful use of negative space by this Egyptian artist here. Um, so that's it, that's, that's space. We talked about um, depth that can exist in images and we've talked about uh, the play against positive and negative shapes. And again, this, this image, this painting by Caravaggio that we've looked at and talked about the depth in it, you should know how, you should see how He's using uh, the light to allow shadows to move and flow from the negative to the positive. Uh, that, that, that there this, is this idea of, an, of a flow of light across surfaces um, from the background to the figure, this, where this figure ground relationship is being compl complicated. It's not just a one to two sort of thing. Um, this movement of the universe into and out of the positive forms. So let's look at your homework. Studio problem number 13. Using narrow dark lines in a tatami format, that is the one to two ratio or the double square, create a unity of shape and a modulation of size from the format. So if it's modulating from the format, then it should modulate in a proportion of one to two, where each shape is double the size of the shape smallest or smaller than it. And each smaller shape is half the size of the one that is larger than it. Give me 10 thumbnails and 10 variations. If you have any questions, send me an email.